right. You have it. Still got it. Yes, sir. All right. Ready to start. <clears throat> this is our 11th lesson in hermeneutics. How to interpret the Bible. Okay, Palmer. Yeah, I think I got the I think I got the screen now. Does it say biblical hermeneutics? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Mute your mic. Marion. Your mic is muted. Can you hear me? Uh, can you see uh, it now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Somehow my mic got muted. I don't know how it got muted. Okay. All right, we're back in lesson 11. And uh, we have a problem with prejudice. We prejudge. We make a decision ahead of time. And... Uh, it's based upon our preconceived ideas or perhaps upon not having all the facts. In Galatians 2, 11 and 12, the apostle Peter was prejudiced. You say, well, here's an apostle, yes. He could preach the truth, but he still had, he still had to obey what he had preached and what he'd been taught. So uh, having the ability to preach the truth infallibly didn't guarantee that you lived exactly everything like it should be lived. Apollos was prejudiced. We see this. You might argue that Apollos had just incomplete information, but not prejudice. That's a possibility. That probably is more likely with Apollos. Acts 18, 24 through 26. We'll look at these passages in a moment. Prejudice is not necessarily dishonesty. Sometimes we have incomplete information or we have had wrong thoughts about something. Now, according to Miriam Webster, prejudice is a preconceived judgment or opinion, and it could be an adverse opinion or leaning toward a form without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. So we can make a decision about someone. And one of the problems with it is sometimes we make a logical fallacy, commit a logical fallacy, which we'll study in the logic course. We'll make a decision about something based upon seeing one or two. I see one or two people of a, of a certain group that are criminals, and I assume everybody in that group is criminal because I, everyone I've seen has been a criminal. That doesn't necessarily mean they're all criminals. Just because you saw a few of them and they were, that, and the ones you saw were. So you, you need to be careful about this, making a preconceived judgment, and that's what prejudice is. Let's look at what Peter, what his problem was. But when Cephas came to Antioch, <clears throat> now Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter, came to Antioch, I resist him to the face because he stood condemned. For before that certain came from James, now the word certain, when you see it, usually refers to someone prominent. Certain came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. So he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. Here in this case, the, even the apostle Peter was, was influenced by pressure, social pressure. 
And so he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he back, he drew back. And he separated himself and was not eating with the Gentiles at this point. So he became an example of prejudice. He allowed certain that came up from James, and this probably is James, the brother of the Lord, but he allowed some them to cause him to not want be willing to continue eating with the Gentiles. So he separated himself. And those they that were of the circumcision probably refers to those who were who were Jews and probably might even refer to those who were trying to bind circumcision upon the, the brethren. But at least it carries the idea of uh, Jews. So he feared those prominent ones, those certain ones of, of the circumcision of the Jews that had come up, prominent perhaps. In verse 13, the rest of the Jews dissembled likewise with him. So they followed his example in so much that even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. A dissimulation is hypocrisy. Peter had been eating with the Gentiles, but when he quitted, when the, these uh, prominent fellows come up, from Jerusalem. And so he was carried away. Even Barnabas was carried away. Now, why he says even Barnabas, Barnabas had gone with Paul out and among the Gentiles to bring the bring the gospel and spread it. And so he had been in Paul's first missionary journey. The, the dissimulate, and that the word itself means to hide under a false appearance. <clears throat> which is the same as hypocrisy. The Greek word is hypocrisy. This word is the same word translated hypocrisy elsewhere. So they were carried away with was playing the hypocrite. So the apostle Peter here played the hypocrite. He, he had been eating with Gentiles and then he quit. When the prominent people came up, he wasn't gonna do it around them. So he'd do it whenever they weren't there, but not when they when they were there. And uh, Paul had to uh, rebuke him for it. And I believe he repented of it. Because it hypocrisy, the Greek word translated dissimulation means hypocrisy in verse 13. The rest of the Jews dissembled like heard with him in so much that even Barnabas was carried away with this their hypocrisy. And so all the rest of the Jews were, were pulled away. So now we were in danger here. This there was a danger here of splitting the church into a Gentile church and a Jewish church. Peter did not properly interpret the word of God because of his prejudice. And we see that racial prejudice was a problem in the early church. The Jews had this strong prejudice. You can read this in Acts 10, his reaction. In the study of the New Testament, you see that the, the Jews were very strong about uh, their views toward Gentiles. And so this was a particular problem in the early church. Paul had to nip it in the bud right here. Oh, it's gonna be a problem. It's about to be a problem in the church. And Peter should have understood that the gospel was for all. Let's look at Mark 16, 15 through 16. And he said unto them, them being the apostles, he, he Jesus, said unto the apostles, Go ye, you apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. And now, to the whole creation, or well, that's Jew and Gentile. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that disbelieveth shall be condemned. It doesn't say anything about being circumcised or keeping the law of Moses. Notice that. So Peter had been commanded even before Acts 2. He had been, he had been commanded by Jesus to go. He and all the apostles had been commanded to go into all the world. Let's look at Acts 2.39. Peter himself still preaching. He says after giving us Acts 2.38, for to you, you Jews, is the promise. And there's an argument about what that promise is. Is it the Abrahamic promise or of salvation, or is it the promise of the Holy Spirit? Uh, and to your children, that would be your offspring, and to all that are far off. Well, 
the term afar off is used throughout the scriptures to refer to the Gentiles and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call unto him. So the Lord is might call these and they still not. So Peter now understands later he understands this, but he had preached it that the gospel was for the Gentiles. Now Perhaps at this stage of the game, the Jews were thinking if these Gentiles become proselyte Jews, they could be part of the kingdom. <clears throat> that might have been their thinking at this stage of the game. But this changed in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. When this vision is given to, Paul, to Peter three times, and he's told to rise, kill, and eat, and these were unclean animals. <clears throat> and so Peter interpreted this when God told him that uh, not to call anything clean, unclean, uh, clean, unclean that he had cleansed in the earlier part of chapter 10. And Peter, in his response here, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius, and this occurred, and Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive, I understand now that God is the respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth God, him, feareth God, feareth him, and worketh righteousness acceptable to him. So here are two conditions. We must have the right attitude toward God, we must have the right actions. Attitude and actions. Actions would include speech and conduct. And so working righteousness is acceptable. So right here now, Peter is recognizing that Gentiles are accepted. So he had already he had already had this information and he understood it. He had gotten it first in the so-called Great Commission. It's not called that the Great Commission in the New Testament, but that's the term we use for it. But uh, in in Mark 16, also Matthew 28, and other passages, it's found. But in Acts 2.39, we see it again, he utters it, and he tells us again, something that he is still not seeing himself. And Peter opened his mouth in Acts 10, 34 and 35, and says, it's for all. The gospel is for everybody. And they must have the right attitude and the right actions. So we see then, Peter had to, take to heart what he had been preaching. He'd been preaching this, and yet he is not living by it. He, I don't think it was it settled down in his mind, but here he, he gave in to fear of these people, fear of prominent people. What, what, what's going to happen? And we can all get in that problem, but this can affect our interpretation of the Bible because he had these verses and he was not following them. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, let's go to Acts 18, 24, an Alexandrian by race, so he's from Alexandria, which would be in northern Egypt, an eloquent man, this really means an educated man, came to Ephesus and he was mighty in the scriptures, so he understood, and this probably would be mighty in the Old Testament scriptures, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. So he was a very zealous man. He spake and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, Jesus' disciples before the cross were preaching baptism, and I believe it was the same baptism John preached. And so he, no doubt, Apollos, had been one who had obeyed, the, uh, had obeyed the instructions of John the Baptist and had been baptized of John's baptism, either that or the baptism of the Lord's disciples. So here he's, he's, he knows this, but let's look at our next slide here. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more accurately. So Priscilla and Aquila uh, heard him. They heard him in the synagogue and they took him aside and took him unto them and expounded. Now the word expounded is an interesting word. 
and I have a, an, an appendix dealing with that word in my role of women book, because this is a critical passage. And I don't believe that they taught him in the sense that some people think they taught him. But we I developed this in more thoroughly in, the, in my book, The Role of Women, the combined edition. The one that hasn't been printed yet, you have the electronic copy of it. So they were able to teach him and they taught him and he was taught by their actions. And uh, so we find it here. They expounded unto him. Now, we, we won't go into what that means, but uh, I would encourage you to read my book and see it. Now, I have a scripture index in the book, so you can look for Acts 18, 26, or, or actually verse 26 particularly in that book and go to the scripture index and find the passage. When he is shown that his knowledge was limited and incomplete, he changed. So he was an honorable man, a very good man. He was honest because when he learned more of the facts, he saw that his knowledge was limited and began to teach more of the truth. That's exactly what God wants. He wants a man or a woman who's honest and will hear the truth and realize that I have been teaching all of it. Or maybe I've been teaching a lot of it, but there's some things I've had wrong and he'll correct them. He or she will correct those things. Prejudice is not necessarily dishonesty. Peter wasn't dishonest. He just didn't consider the effects of his actions, I believe, in Galatians 2. An honest man might, might be maybe prejudiced, but he will change his mind when he's shown his error. And I'm not sure that you could say that uh, Paulus was prejudiced, but he had this preconceived judgment or opinion based upon the incomplete facts, incomplete information. And so he had this preconceived notion about what ought to be taught and was teaching. This is a form of unrighteousness, however, not judging everyone by the same standard. We need to be very careful about that because we can be good men and do things that are unrighteous. I'm convinced that we can show it in the fifth chapter of uh, First Timothy that this good man, Timothy, was unrighteous in something he did and his treatment of elders. But we won't be looking at that right now. All people have preconceived notions. We have prejudices. A foolish man will never change his mind when he's shown facts. Have our senses educated by the word of God. And we see this in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for full-grown men, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. We have to exercise our senses. He talks about two kinds of food, milk and solid food. And so what we have here is we have this solid food and some solid is milk and meat, but this is solid food, the American Standard renders it for mature men. Full grown is someone who's mature. And, and a mature person is one who exercises his senses to discern good and evil. We must be led by the word of God and be honest enough to change our minds as we learn more of the scriptures. That's critical. We must let the scriptures lead us and guide us. Until people recognize that they have imperfect knowledge or might have imperfect knowledge on a particular matter. Therefore, their ideas may not be right. They will not arrive at the knowledge of the truth. This is true because we will not study in order to grow. As we study more and more, we find that our views of some passage, even a passage of scripture, might not be correct. So we need to be aware that we need to be open to, re to study of God's word but we don't need to be gullible, so uh, we want to get into that later. Don't want to certainly be gullible. Our knowledge must must grow, and we can grow in grace thereby. Look at Second Peter three eighteen. Peter, in almost his last words that he wrote, he says, "But grow in the grace and knowledge." Well, this is the commandment. 
So we are to grow in, in knowledge as well as in favor with God. And so grow in the grace and knowledge of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To be the glory of both now and forever. Amen. So we are to grow in grace. We are to grow in knowledge. This is telling me that we must continually grow and study God's word. We must form our convictions on the knowledge we possess. That's that's all we can do. And so if our knowledge is limited, we have an elementary knowledge, our convictions might be wrong about certain things. We must be willing to change our conviction as our knowledge increases. But it's knowledge of God's word that we're looking at. If further study reveals that we formed the wrong convictions. So that's that's where we must stand. We must say, I'm going to let the word of God guide me and I'll approach it with a reasonable, rational approach to study of God's word. It must not be interpreted to mean that we cannot know, be sure of the truth. Once we have considered the complete word of God, we can be sure we have the truth. So a study of God's word. And we'll get into this in the logic class, but I believe we we can use induction and and inductively arrive at the truth. We'll get that in that in that class in logic class that's next hour. That'll be later in the course. A prejudiced but honest heart, a honest person. They study the scriptures in note Mark 16, 15, and 16, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, first Peter 3, 21. So what determined the baptism is central to salvation. He or she may read and study to say, yes, I can see I, uh, baptism is essential. But if they have grown up with a limited knowledge of baptism, they may think that sprinkling is baptism. And if they grew up Believing or being having been taught that they have this error in their thinking, they will think that they, if they're sprinkled for the for remission of sins, that they'll be saved. And so, what we have here is this will be an incomplete information, some prejudice or prejudge. They made a decision without all the facts. He has not considered all the facts, such as. Romans 6, 4, baptism is burial. And he, as he learns, he, he sees that. He said, well, that sprinkling won't fit that. So he studies more deeply and he learns that the Greek word translated baptized actually means to dip. And that would uh, that would go with immersion, but not with sprinkling. He, he eventually learns, he studies. He begins to study it. He says, there's something wrong with my thinking on this. When he reads Romans 6, 4. And then he'll turn and he'll begin to study more diligently. Then he'll seek out the answer to it. Because if he believes that the Bible is from God, it, he knows it doesn't contradict itself. So the, uh, the apparent problem is not in the, that the Bible contradicts, but that my definition of the word baptize, thinking it's sprinkling. Is contradictory to what we see in Romans 6 4. He's going to eventually learn he's not been truly baptized as he studies. Honesty demands that he admit his error and rectify it or correct it. Let's look at Romans 6 4. We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death. See, baptism is a burial then. That like as Christ was raised from the dead. I believe baptism is not only a burial, but it is a resurrection. When I baptize someone, I put them under water. I don't hold them there. I bring them out from that water and I raise them out of the water and they're raised from the dead uh, through the glory of the Father. So we also might walk in the newness of life. And the intention is an expectation. God expects that person to try to live a new life in a new way after he or she has been baptized after they've been raised from the dead out of the water. And I, I believe, I'm convinced that when we come out of the water is when the actual forgiveness occurs. Look at Colossians 2.12 as we're coming out. Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
again, Colossians 2.12 says, the sense of the same thing as Romans 6.4. So the, the baptism is a burial that won't fit sprinkling, it won't fit pouring either. And so we, we can't get one of those two so-called modes of baptism uh, into this verses. We can't get it. They won't fit these two verses. So we have preconceived notion. Educational background may affect us, cultural background, other things may affect us. If a person has studied the biological sciences in college, he may be predisposed to think the serial theory of organic microevolution, that is amoeba to man, is true. And this could affect his interpretation of chapters one and two of Genesis. And he needs to study carefully and look at the facts on that. He may attempt to reconcile his prejudice with that, that what the scriptures say. So he may reconcile this in his mind, at least, with the theory of what's, what is called theistic evolution, which uh, I believe is completely false. But we don't have time to delve, delve into it right here. But see, that background that he has will cause him to start thinking that way and he begins to see it that way. If a person has grown up in a society that hated other races, he may be predisposed to interpret the scriptures in such ways to draw his conclusion that other races are less than human in some manner. Or may have some idea like that. The doctrine of racial superiority is almost certain to come from the doctrine of organic microevolution. Right? If we're all involved, some could be evolved further than others. Some could be further down the evolutionary chain. So this doctrine would feed it, not that it didn't exist before. Certainly it existed before this theory of evolution came out by Darwin, but we have uh, this idea that feeds it and uh, causes it to become even worse. The problem is worse with this. Things by scientists to have proven Earth's about four, four million years old may lead to creation and recreation theory of Genesis 1. There's a theory that God created and then all these soft fossils then were destroyed and then he created again. Creation and recreation, that, that won't fit the New Testament or the Old Testament either. won't fit the Bible. Uh, the, another theory is the gap theory of Genesis 1. If there's a gap between the various days, the days occurred, and then there's millions of years between each gap, a day. The age theory that each day was a long period of time. The days weren't 24 hour days, there were hundreds of millions of years. Each day was. Names of Genesis 1 through 11 are a series of myths. <clears throat> so we can see that and hear that as well. So the claims that these are a series of myths. And so the, you'll see these things occurring. Someone is predisposed to accept these views when they're taught them because of their background. And it's easy for them to be drawn into these things. So people need to be aware of that. So a person that's converted with that kind of a background, he needs the church and that we need to very strongly uh, providing information or evidence that these these creation, recreation, gap theory, age theory, and so forth, and local flood theory and so forth are all false. And the New Testament and the Old Testament doesn't have myths in it. Neither, none of the Bible has myths in it. It's not, not myths taught by God's, God's people. When an honest man is shown that he's in error, one of two things happens. There's going to be one of two things if he's honest. Either he admits his error and changes the way he, that he's thinking, or he becomes dishonest and denies his error. And that can happen. But one might argue that he wasn't honest to begin with, and that's a possibility too. But I would say that if we, if we allow that he's honest, he might eventually, in his honesty, he, he might... Uh, want to keep his thinking because he hadn't given up his thinking. He hasn't seen the error of his thinking, his prior thinking. So our ba educational background can be a factor, a negative factor in our 
in our study of God's word. So it can it can be a hindrance. It can be a help to us, but it can be a hindrance too. Now that means yes. Prejudice is a hindrance to the study of God's word. It gets in the way of our seeing things. It makes us where we're blinded to the truth. As we saw with those who have this wrong idea about how man got here, creation versus evolution, uh, macroevolution. Peter had a problem with it in Galatians 2, 11 and 12. He had to be reproved. Now reproving is, the word reprove is, is defined for us in the third chapter of John. What it means is to shed light upon something. And so when Peter was reproved, light was shed upon the truth. And he was then rebuked by Paul. He repented, however, we see this, uh, evidence of this in other passages and following the teaching of the scriptures. This may have been prejudiced, it's possible, but he had incomplete information and he was acting upon that and teaching what was wrong. I would argue that he was prejudiced. I would say he might have just been ignorant and ignorant doesn't mean stupid because he was a very brilliant man. Ignorant means that we don't know the facts in the matter. We don't know all the facts. And so a person acts upon what information he has and he acts upon that information and Apollos was acting upon it with great zeal, but he was wrong. And whenever he was shown his error, then Apollos then corrected it immediately and began to do what was what needed to be done. He was teaching the truth then. So Apollos may have been prejudiced, but we know at least he had the incomplete information. But when he learned more of the truth, he followed the truth. And I think we could argue that Apollos was an honestly mistaken man. Apollos was honest because when he learned more of the facts, he saw that his knowledge was limited and began to teach more of the truth. And this is a this is an honorable and a good man when he does that. And uh, sometimes a person can be so arrogant that they won't admit that they might be wrong on something. And this can happen if a person gets a bunch of college degrees that can cut, can puff one up if he's not careful. And that's why I, I highly object to men who have doctor degrees being called doctor from in the, in the church. I highly object to it because it can puff a man up. We don't need that. So that can be a problem for us. Prejudice is not necessarily dishonesty. Neither Peter nor Paulus were dishonest. Peter, in a moment of weakness, was afraid away and away from what he knew that he should be doing. Apollos was just not, he was ignorant, that is. He just didn't have the, all the facts. He didn't know all the truth. Prejudice can, can come because of, because of ignorance of the truth and it's of errors that have been taught by others. Sometimes we grow up and taught things when we're younger, and uh, these these things may or may not be true. And so our parents may have taught us this. We may have been taught it by by attending a denominational church or something of that order, or we may have even been taught it by some members of the church. Uh, there are members of the church that don't always teach the truth, so we need to be aware of that. So we accept the errors that we've been taught. And incomplete knowledge of the scriptures, as I pointed out with baptism. Growing up thinking that baptism is sprinkling, and then you read it, you say, well, I need to be sprinkled, because that's what you think baptism is. That's your incomplete knowledge. And then you, you get yourself sprinkled, and you find out later that it's the burial. And you study more carefully on it, and you begin to study it and then not learn that the word from which the Greek word that from which baptized or baptism is translated means to dip. And it means to immerse, therefore. So you dip or immerse. And so it's an immersion, it's not a sprinkling. And if you study it more carefully, you'll find that 
the, uh, the Greek word it definitely means that to, to dip or to get one all wet, completely wet, or cover up, or bury, as we see it. We put all these synonyms together, and we can look at it now. If we go to Acts eight, for example, we see that Philip and the eunuch uh, they traveled and he wanted to be baptized. The eunuch did. And so when he's desiring to be baptized, they stop the chariot and they go both go down into the water. But if you're sprinkling somebody, you wouldn't need to go down in the water. You just reach down and get some water in your hand and sprinkle it on top of the person. That wouldn't fit. But what happened there is they both got out of the chariot. They both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. So that tells me that it's more than sprinkling just by implication. And it, so it doesn't fit, you see. Over and over, we see it doesn't fit. Now, John the Baptist was baptizing in the Enon near to Salem because there was much water there. So baptism seemed to require much water. It required going down into the water. It was a burial. So when we put all those facts together, we can draw the conclusion there must be more to it than sprinkling. So I better check on it more. And I see it's a burial. And I say, that won't fit sprinkling. And the other two wouldn't be what you'd normally do if you were sprinkling. So when we look, put all these facts together, then we study the meaning of the word, and then the prejudice is removed. And we see more clearly at that point. So we must allow the scriptures to veto and trump. I'm using not this for our former president, but I'm using this for like a card game to trump or to override. We must set it aside. No, we must allow the scriptures to veto Trump or override our secular education. Whatever we've been taught in secular education, we must allow the scriptures to override that because secular education and the people teaching in secular education are always right. And if it contradicts if the Bible is God's word, truly God's word, then it is infinitely superior to the textbooks of men. We must allow it, the scriptures to be told Trump or override our life experiences. We must allow that to occur. We must allow the scriptures to be told Trump or override our cultural background, what we've learned in our cultural background. The scriptures are our standard. That must be the case. Now, do you have any questions? Well, I have one comment. Okay. In, uh, in Acts 10, while Peter was preaching, even though he said that he knew that God shows no partiality, why then did the Holy Spirit have to come down on the Gentiles and let them speak in tongues in order for him to command them to be baptized? Because apparently they was ready. They, they said they was ready to hear, but they... Uh -huh. But Peter, apparently Peter wasn't getting the the idea. In the part, prior part of the chapter, Peter was told to go out. And when he went when he went, when he went someone's got their mic. Uh, uh, take, turn your mic off. Okay, get it. Uh, it's getting feedback. Uh, what he did was, in the first part of chapter 10, he gets the vision. The vision where they left the sheet down, great sheet, with all kinds of animals, he's hungry. And he's told to rise, kill, and eat. This occurs three times. And then this, these men are, have been sent by an angel that sent them to come down and find him. And uh, so they're at the gate knocking, trying to get in and wanting him. And God tells them to go with them at, uh, and not to doubt anything, not doubt him. So he's told by God in that vision not to doubt. Don't, don't be doubtful. But he took witnesses with him. There's either six or seven witnesses. And he took probably the leaders of the church there, most likely. And perhaps men who were had already had miraculous gifts, prophets in the church and others. So he took these as witnesses is what happened. 
the events occurred on Pentecost, at Pentecost, God directly gave miraculous ability in Pentecost. Now, we see that God gave miraculous ability to the Gentiles in Acts 10, but he did it directly. If God had given that miraculous ability to the laying on of Peter's hands, all Gentiles would have been looked upon by Jews as being inferior. You had to go to a Jew to get your gifts. That's my, my interpretation of it. And God said, I will bypass that. And that's why he gave directly to Cornelius in his household, those in his household. Uh, and it was a once a one time occurrence and it never was repeated again. And all others received their gifts by the laying on apostles hands. God had forever made the Jews and Gentiles equal by directly giving it to both of them. Now, the Cornelius didn't get the same power as the apostles got, but it came without the intermediary of a thing on of hands. Does that help a bit? Yeah, I can see. I can see that. I, I just kind of thought that Peter was still being prejudiced and being influenced of being a Jew, and the Gentiles was still unclean. And I, I, I just always thought that he just didn't really get the idea that. God was wanting them to be saved also until I think after he's trouble. With I think his Jewish background was had to be overcome here. And this yeah. miraculous miraculous event helped to overcome it. God told him, you see, when you read right. it, I draw the conclusion that that Peter had this problem and as as most Jews did. And uh, he had this problem. And he had to have it overcome by the events. And so that he said, now I see it. You see, I see this now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my Bible to it. We're going to read it. And hopefully we have enough time to read it. But he says here. And I'll start reading here. On the morrow he arose, that's in verse 23 and following. So he came together. Cornelius and his kinsmen in verse 24. Peter entered and Peter raised up saying, stand up by myself a man to talk with him. He said, he find as many come together. And how is it in law? You know it's an unlawful thing, verse 28, for a man that is a Jew to join himself coming to one or another nation, and yet unto me hath God showed that I should not call any man common or unclean. Peter had already drawn the conclusion that Jews Gentile people were no longer unclean. And I will get to the a fortiori principle in our study, which I think is maybe our next lesson. We'll get into this in the next lesson or two, if my memory's right. And we have a, a fortiori principle in logic as well. But what we see here is we'll lay this out in more detail, much more clearly, when we get to the a fortiori principle, which I think is our next lesson. Does that make sense now? What's true of the lesser is true of the greater in the Bible. That's a principle That's here. And God has shown me that I should not call any man common or anything, but the vision he got had to do with animals. So if an animal is no longer unclean, then a man is no longer unclean. Because people are greater than animals. Does that make sense now a little better? Yeah, it does. I, I just never really heard it quite like that, and it, it, it does make sense. Well, I just uh, never really picked up on that one one part as <clears throat> much as I should have. You so, know, of him admitting that God has shown not to call anything common or unclean. I mean, I've I've, I've read it plenty of times and and talked about it, but I just never really drew the conclusion that that you you explained and and that makes well, I, sense i think our next lesson is on uh a fortiori principle i believe that's correct my memory's right and if it is we'll be into this next week i will get into it next week in more detail we'll start into it that a fortiori principle is a very important principle in interpreting the bible and we'll use it over and over 
and we'll, it'll be very useful to us. Okay, any questions, any other questions? <clears throat> Marion? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah. I, I'm not sure if I understood uh, the question or not, but would this also be a fulfillment of Joel 2, 2.28? Definitely. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at why the spirit was poured on the Gentiles, and that would be a, a a credit to the inspiration of the Bible. Yes, yes. Uh, they they had to understand. Of course, the Jews were reasoning around this this passage, and they how they reasoned around it, and it was their prejudice. They just they thought. In these Gentiles, they can they can become part of God's kingdom, but they got to be proselyte Jews first. I think that was their thinking, some of them at least. And that that thinking had to get be be uh, uh, taken care of. We have to root it out and get it out of their thinking. And we can have wrong thinking too ourselves if we're not careful. We can have some wrong thinking. Okay. Now, let me illustrate this, and we're almost to the point we've got to quit. But uh, what we run into is with uh, other passages. The Jews, for example, when they read the 110th Psalm, they saw that somebody was to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Well, it's pretty obvious it's Messiah, but they couldn't accept that. Why? Well, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us why. It doesn't exactly mention their problem, but it shows us that you can't be a priest if you're the tribe of Judah and under the law of Moses. So the Jews thought, well, the law of Moses is going to last forever. And so we we have to interpret this. It looks like Messiah he's talking about, but it's got to be someone else because Messiah's, uh, we know he's tribe of, uh, he's descendant of David, he's tribe of Judah. And so, but when we study it more carefully, it implies that God's going to have to have a new covenant and a new, new covenant which will allow one to be a king after those seed of David and I'm so high priest. Which would couldn't be have couldn't happen under the law of Moses. So again, their prejudices cause them to be misinterpreting that passage in Psalm 110. Does that make sense now? Any other comments or questions? All right, I'm going to stop recording.